Whoa. Mike Muse is an industrial engineer, a music executive, a political architect. He breaks down the intersection of politics and pop culture. This is the Mike Muse Show. Well, Grace, have you thought any more about the Vegas residency? Actually, I think it's time I record a new album. I mean, that's one plan. What am I supposed to say to her? What's up, bro? It's your boy, Mike Muse. Welcome to the African Conversation the Mike Muse Show. I am so excited you have joined me for this next round of conversation. As you know, I'm in competition with nobody but myself. But I am so proud of myself right now because I've been working hard to get this next guest. I've been fighting myself to get this person. I've been losing. So finally, I have won the race, which is a metaphor of people that life is a marathon and not a sprint. One day you may win the race and get Tracy Ellis Ross on your show too. Just keep believing. Ladies and gentlemen, Tracy Ellis Ross. What's happening, Tracy? That's amazing. First of all, um, perfect timing because you're winning the race and finally like <laughs> keeping to it is exactly what the message of the movie is. Like literally, what are you literally what are you the there? message of the movie. Yes. So you are right on time. I see why you went to Brown. I get it. I understand now. <laughs> I appreciate it. Trace, I'm going to try to win. You have been somewhat, I've been admiring from afar for so long. Your um, range, and, and first of all, ladies and gentlemen, we're talking about the movie High Note. Let me just act like you guys, you guys are coming into a conversation. Trace and I are already warmed up. We've been talking offline for a second. But Tracy Ellis Ross is here to promote this fantastic film called High Note, uh, which is in streaming now. You can watch it. You can see it. Please check it out on all the platforms that Tracy will talk about, all the promotional aspects of it. But I've had the pleasure of watching it ahead of time. It is a fantastic film. I have enjoyed it. I'm going to get into a lot of the, uh, the points that were made, the direction they went in strategically, why they didn't lean in certain areas, why they leaned into other areas. We're going to get into all of that. But as a metaphor, Tracy, for me, what I saw was that I've always admired your range, right? And your relatability. Yeah. You've always had this ability to come across a strip, the screen as everyone's friend, right? Like everyone's homie, right? Like I would love to go to brunch with you one day. I've always had that feeling like you're like a brunch buddy for me. Like we can just laugh and talk about a range of conversations. We've always seen you being this incredible comedic individual. I love when you host award shows, like you kill it every time. But now we see you in this very dramatic role. Um, and then we hear you singing, right? And so your range is unbelievable. So talk to us about like finding your voice in every role that you do. And you're not afraid to be put in a box. What drives that constitution of you? Um, you know, I think I, so many of us have been looking out at the world and seeing women and anyone, just human beings, like as if you are one thing. And I think we're all so multifaceted. We all have so many sides to us. Sometimes we're like the businesswoman. Sometimes we're handling stuff. Sometimes we just want to feel sexy and loved. So all these different aspects of who we are. And I have all those interests. And I figured why live a life where I have to stick in one lane? Why not live a life that actually reflects the fullness of who I am and show people that um, you can be free in all of those places and it doesn't mean that you are um, trying to be something that you're not. It was also the reason this movie was so interesting to me. I felt like the message, the overall message of this movie for both Maggie, who plays my character, Grace Davis' assistant, and Grace Davis, they're both two women who are trying to be something the world doesn't want them to be. The world is telling them to stay in their lane. Maggie is a woman, and people are played by Dakota Johnson, is a woman that the world is saying, like, get me coffee. Like, you're the person who should be getting me coffee. And she wants to be a music producer, and there's so few female music producers. My character is this larger-than-life, you know, world-renowned superstar with decades of hits. And her, her manager and the world is like, just, and her record company are like, play it safe. Do what you're doing. You're too old to try something new. And I feel like it's so relatable for so many people. You don't have to be an international icon or want to be a music producer. The human spirit always wants to keep going after our dreams. We all have so many different fires inside of, uh, inside of us, so many different things we want to try. And why at any stage, age, or phase of your life should you stop being that? 
Um, so I think for me, it's the same thing. It's like, I, I, I have things I want to try. I want to write a book. I wanted to start a hair company. I want to be an executive producer. And I'm so grateful that these opportunities have started to arise for me at an adult age where I actually don't need them. It's what I want to share, which I think is a huge difference um, than being in my 20s. I'm fixing my lens. No, no, it, look, it looks fine. So I understand. And this is a note, Trace, we didn't get a chance to talk about this beforehand. I've been having issues with my Wi-Fi in this building. So if it turns out, I'm going to hit you right back, okay. back in on my cell phone. It'll take it from my cell phone. All right. But what we're just saying is something really interesting in how you said you don't have to be this international icon. I was using myself for an example is I went to the University of Michigan, I did industrial engineering, and I did nuclear chemical research. And then all of a sudden, I found myself co-owning a record label. And then all of a sudden, I found myself then becoming a national fundraiser for the first black president and became the youngest raise a million dollars for any sitting presidential candidate. And then now I'm on to media platforms doing radio and television. But I will say this, Tracy, at every point along the way, I was always told I couldn't do that. Right. I was always I would never be successful because one thing never connected to the other in other people's eyes. Right. But what I was doing was always following my curiosity and my curiosity landed me in every new place and space that I'm in. And so it's really about the art of the pivot, which is what your character, Grace Davis, shows so eloquently well in this film. And the assistant also shows so eloquently well in this film. Which you know you say, you say, it's so interesting because you said I found myself, but what we never talk about is what it takes to find yourself there, right? Mm -hmm. Because there is, there are so many pieces in between, so many personal steps, so many walks through your own fear, walks through what fear that looks like a monster, but was really smoke and mirrors, um, learning a new skill. Even if you want to do something, it doesn't mean you know how to do something and continuing to do all those things. And I think those are the things that I like to really break down for people because we forget, we always compare our insides to other people's outsides, right? It's like so easy for some, it looks like it's so easy for someone else, but the truth is that it's not. It's just that you continue to let your dream, your desire, and your curiosity be bigger than the fear and be bigger than the naysayers, which is not an easy thing to do. It's not for the faint of heart. But I feel like if you keep doing the next indicated thing, the next indicated action, and keep your focus on the work and not what people think of you, you like the world is your oyster. Yeah, it absolutely is. I love how you said about the work residing in your fear, sitting in your fear, but not letting that to be held captive. That is very much a mantra that I've always believed in for so long is, I think for sometimes as human beings, we are told to suppress your feelings and just move on. Uh, I think you have to acknowledge your feelings, acknowledge what you're feeling, and then don't reside in that feeling, but be able to step out. And I think that is a difference from going from good to great, right? And going yeah. from to actually living out your dreams. Well, also, you know, people don't talk about the fact that um, uncomfortable feelings, sharp feelings, sticky fe feelings, um, heavy feelings are just feelings. I always like to say that feelings are not the truth, but they are the truth of your experience. And they're often a pathway that moves you to the next place. And I think I also look at feelings like clouds in the sky, like let them move. You don't come outside and go, clouds, go away. You go, okay, so do we put on rain clothes today? Is it going to rain? Are these going to be like hefty clouds? Like, what's the scoop? So if you can let your feelings just move, then I feel like often they are indications and information for you about either where you don't want to go or where you do want to go. Yeah. And it's so important, I think, personally, to let them move. I. The other thing I feel is like, Feelings, if you don't have them, they will find you. Yeah. And I would prefer to have them when they're there and when I know what they are and to give them safe space mm -hmm. than to let them come out of my neck in some backwards way when I unexpect it. So I want to ask, how then do you compartmentalize? Because it's interesting you and I are having this conversation, and my audience knows that I never pre-plan any questions. I actually never know what I'm going to talk to my guests about. I kind of let the energy just flow. And so we're landing in places that I never thought we would be, but 
here we are. But I also believe that it's so relevant, not only for the film, but as we're existing in this global pandemic, which is COVID-19, as we're all yeah. staying in place and staying at home, there is this notion and people are feeling pressure to find their passion to learn a new skill, to learn a new craft and trade craft, which I don't believe in whatsoever. Oh my God. People who are sitting in feelings, right? And who may be dreaming up of things, they have a little bit more time. I just told you all the slashes that I have. You just mentioned the triple slashes that you have. What advice would you give to individuals who are looking to add on slashes and to compartmentalize how you go after the things that you go after? Well, I first want to talk about the time that we're in because I feel like, you know, I think so many people, we walked into this, we thought it was going to be two weeks. We're going to clean out our closets. We're going to do all these things. Yeah. Um, first off, it is not two weeks. This is not a vacation. There is a sense of collective trauma, collective pain, and collective loss that is very present for all of us in this collective consciousness. So for all of us, so we are, we are in an experience that requires some real heavy lifting in terms of the feelings that are here without a real explanation. Like, yes, if you have lost your job, you are going to know what you're feeling. Yes, if you have been furloughed. Yes, if you have my condolences and um, heart absolutely goes out to so many who have lost loved ones and who have not been able to honor the ritual of mourning in the way that we as humans know how to do that. So those feelings, I think, um, even in, in those, they're difficult, extremely extra difficult in this time because we can't do the things as humans that we know how to do to soothe those things. But then there's also the unexplained feelings that are going on that feel like, you know, I'm fine, I'm safe in my home or I'm with my, whatever that is, but I still can't get to sleep at night. I'm looking at a computer screen more than normal. So there's a lot for us to process and that takes time. And that takes a real holding of oneself. And so it's not that you just have all this extra time to be cleaning out your closets. It's like, how can you really honor yourself, hold space for yourself gently and lovingly and meet yourself where you are without ignoring what is happening? So that's one thing. And then I think the other part is for those in this time where we have more space to wander, ponder, and be. And, and I want to add another thing about the time. Yeah. Everybody also, you know, for example, the convenience of I'm hungry, I'm going to order something. I'm going to go get takeout. I'm going to go get fast food. No, you got to figure out when you're hungry, what you want to eat, and then make the food. Then you got to clean up the plate, not just throw away a takeout dish. And so all of that takes more time. You know, I'm, it's like, it was so funny to me. That I'm so off course, but it's hilarious. So you're fine. I'm loving this. Yeah. So I rarely am home when I'm in my life. I move at a pace that is nuts. Like this room is one of my favorite rooms in my house. I'm never in it. Yeah. I've gotten to spend beautiful time here, right? Um, I know that every time you cook, you got to clean up the kitchen. But I'm rarely, it's like, what, on a weekend I actually make a big meal? Or on holidays with family you make a big meal? Usually it's like I make something quick, I heat something up when I'm home, whatever that is. You got to sweep after each cooking experience. You got to wash the stove top down. You got to clean the stove top down. I don't like it to be left dirty after I wash. You got to wash each pot and your plates. Yes. I don't have a dishwasher. People think I'm crazy, but I don't. I don't. I have an old house, which is what I love, and I never put in a dishwasher. So, <laughs> I mean, all I can say is everything takes a different amount of time because we're used to a different kind of convenience yeah. and a different kind of pace. So cleaning out the closet might not be the thing. Lessen your expectations around who and what you're supposed to be doing. Now, during this time, there is a lot of space to wander, ponder, and be. Different kinds of space to be with yourself, to not be busy with a schedule. And my thinking is, if you can, in those spaces, dream without the judgment. Let it be a spaghetti session before you start editing. Mm. Before you start deciding what could work or couldn't work or why it could work or why it couldn't work, 
give yourself time to dream. Give yourself time to vision something new. And by the way, my suggestion, my, my offering to everybody is dream of a different world. We are not going back to the normal we had. And in many ways, thank God, this pandemic has really shown us an inequity, inequities that have existed beyond this moment. Yeah. This is now making things glaringly obvious to people who haven't seen them before. But the inequities in this system that we live in do not work. Those that are essential are not cared for. Those that are apparently in below the poverty line, even those that are above it cannot make livings to sustain their lives on the most basic levels, choosing between medication and food. And that is not the American way. We need to change this. And so I hope that when you are dreaming of the different things you wanna do that live out your heart's desires, you are also envisioning a world where you remember within your work, within your day, within your life, when you go to vote, that you are as strong as your most vulnerable neighbor. And we have to do that. And I, and I feel like this is one of those moments for us to awaken to the interconnectedness of our humanity, and not just in this country, across the globe. This has been an equalizer of, it is all of us, like everything else, but for some reason, and unfortunately, it takes a virus for us to wake up to how connected we are as people. And even you're talking about the connectedness and the connectivity, and I just think about how with the inequities of the systems, I've been doing a lot of conversations of my heart and my passion and things I advocate for are black boys in particular, right? In particular through our K through 12 system, um, for all the reason and data that Bravo I'll you. about and things that, that you know that exists, especially from school to prison pipeline, exists within that third and fourth grade transition where black boys are most impacted for. And so education is being a big- What is the age you said? Third grade and fourth grade. So what How happens is, that? yep. So what happens is pre, from pre-K to kindergarten, white children hear words at an X amount of rate more than black children just in general. But then what happens is once you get to third and fourth grade, black boys have experienced so much more disciplinary action within school. And in particular, uh, bless you. Bless you. <laughs> yeah, bless you. Um, and in particular, suspensions, uh, removed from the classroom. So it's been such that, a yeah, there's been such interruption by the time they get to third and fourth grade. So by that time, they already are behind in reading levels. And at that point, they actually are behind reading levels and actually black girls are. And then what you see is you see that split happen. So if a black boy isn't at the third grade reading level and it has proved the proficiency of it by the conclusion of that year, by the time it goes into fourth grade, he's already behind, which wow. creates a domino effect up into the senior year. And that's where you see high increase of dropout rates for black boys in high school at a higher rate than their white male counterparts and a higher rate than their black female counterparts. But then that affects them matriculating into colleges at a lesser rate. And then that affects them matriculating to actually completion of the, of the four or five year degree, which then you see the difficulty of matriculation for their master's degrees, which as black women are 70% out of the minority group and base, black women make up 70% of those who have graduated from an advanced degree situation. So there is a disparity gap that exists. And so for me, what I do, Tracy, is I sit in that uncomfortability we talked about before and stand on my square for black boys. As difficult it is because everyone wants to say, well, what about the others, right? And I always have to qualify, unfortunately, Tracy, in all my writings and op-eds that I do always have to say, just because I'm advocating for Black boys doesn't mean I'm saying other groups shouldn't be advocated for. Doesn't mean I'm saying that other demographics shouldn't be advocated for. But if you heard the way I just outlined it, Tracy, it goes to the nuance, right? Like, sometimes we do these broad strokes, right? And we talk about education from this general term. Right? But well, if you are very specific in terms of solutions and policies you're creating, you'll never see action oriented results to actually solve the problem if you don't acknowledge it and if you don't call it by its name. Well, I also I agree with you completely. Bravo for the work that you're doing. Thank you for the work that you're doing. Thank you. Um, and being an example in that way, and also for following your own specificity and your own passion, because I would imagine. Um, that it brings great fulfillment to you um, and allows you, you know, I feel like self-esteem comes from esteemable acts mm -hmm. and being of service is really how we do that. 
And yeah. so thank you for that. Um, I also think that the specificity of where each of us put our hands and our hearts and our minds is, is how this whole thing works. Not one of us can't fix the whole thing, but all of us can fix it if we keep doing what we do. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so uh, I, I really appreciate you explaining that and yeah. also having a justification so that when the naysayers ask why, you actually can lay it out. Yeah. Um, my mission is different, and I think each of us have a different place in a different way. I have a heart that wants to do it all, and I have hands that need to stay connected to the specificity of not only my skills, my platform, and what makes my heart sing. Mm -hmm. So my base is always joy and the revolutionary act of joy. Yeah. Um, because it's something I was inherently born with somehow. And so, and I, and I feel that particularly as people of color, so much of our experience is steeped in the struggle and understandably so. And I really feel like there is a, a, a pathway to thriving when you focus on the joy and it's not easy to find joy when you are constantly trying to survive and i understand that and my that that sort of thread of joy threads through for me my desire to expand the real estate for black women mm -hmm. um to continue to teach and show through example how to own our own narratives our own equity and to exemplify and show and celebrate our beauty and our importance and our power um, in how we take up space yeah. because the world has given us much, such small amounts of real estate. So my hand goes in different ways. I have examples of the way I choose roles, the kind of women I choose to play, um, what I do in the storytelling, how I fight behind the scenes for the tweaks and the nuances that make a huge difference in how our story is told, whether it's the director making sure it's a woman or a woman of color if I can, department heads in different places on a production, um, making sure the story itself is telling something that shows us in a different light and expands how we are seen. My hair company, for example, is really about meeting the unmet needs of the curly, coily, and tight textured community. But more than that, offering us a place, another place to see ourselves in our glory and our authentic beauty. Um, executive producing and directing and trying different places where I can keep being a part of the person who creates the content so that our tables continue to be filled with the right voices and the right eyes because we all have different blind spots and wanting to make sure that I don't, I even have my own blind spots so that there's others that can continue to see a fuller picture. Yeah. And, um, and it's one of the reasons I did choose this film, The High Spot, The High, the high Spot, The, the high, high Note. <laughs> um, I can't remember, The High Note. Um, I felt like this, the message I talked about at the beginning when we started talking was incredibly important that there's, it's never too late. It's always on time for you to venture outside of what people expect of you and also for you to keep going for your dreams. Mm -hmm. It was also a film that was about two women that were on parallel paths, but not against each other. They actually were in support of each other. Um, and it brings joy. It is a movie about, and you know, I think so often those people in our culture that do great things and are big, important people, we forget that they're human beings. Yeah. We forget that they have fears and insecurities and vulnerabilities and dreams that they still want to try new things, that they have secrets. And so I was grateful to take on a role that Typically, people would imagine what it would be, that it would be the shtick of something, but it was about something else. Yeah. Well, Tracy, I don't want to keep you. We can talk all day. I know you have other commitments. You have this to is a wonderful but conversation. Very, I really appreciate what it. What I love most about what we just said was that it all comes down to, we were talking about earlier about getting off the couch, accepting your feelings, emotions, how do you compartmentalize, you and I advocating for different things in different spaces, it's okay because what happens is we're always so concerned about saving the whale that we forget about if you save the goldfish, you automatically change the ecosystem, which plays into a larger narrative. And I'm gonna close with your point of joy. The joy I have right now is knowing that my job was complete, that we did a whole conversation of 25 minutes 
without having to keep promoting high note, but talking about all the elements of high note, which it is. And that's yeah. the beauty of this film. Um, and ladies and gentlemen, everything in high note is literally everything that you just heard us talk about right now, which is why you need to go see it. And which is why, Tracy, I love what it's about doing. That brings me joy knowing that we didn't have to do a traditional marketing and push. I, I agree. I thought that was wonderful. Can I end with one other thing? Sure, yeah. Okay. So you, you Natalie, know. she wants to end it, not me. Go ahead. <laughs> Natalie is like chatting me up like Okay, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, time. Natalie. I'm sorry. <laughs> you you've said compartmentalize twice. Yeah. And I will say that I don't use compartments. Oh, you don't. I do my best to create and walk towards a sense of wholeness where all the doors and windows are open mm -hmm. and that there's place and space for all of these different aspects without putting them behind closed doors and behind compartments. That my, my um, sort of mm, trajectory is towards wholeness, not even wellness, wholeness that makes space for the good, the bad, the sticky, the sharp, the ugly, the great, the beautiful, the juicy, and the joyful. Yeah. And that there is a space for all of it in this very large container that is my soul and my life. And I wish and hope the same for each of you. As you say in the film, I forgive myself for saying compartmentalization. <laughs> that was the best line. That is, I, that is not, that's hilarious. That was not a critique. That was offering of a new frame. Oh, I know. I'm having a good time with it. No, I totally meant what you okay. said. I just love that line in there. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, that's my show. Stay right there. We'll be right back. Tune in to High Note ASAP. My life is a joke! Ugh. It's really bleak out there for middle-aged singers. In the history of music, only five women over 40 have ever had a number one hit. And only one of them was black. What? What is this? What happened to your hair? Yeah, this is what I came out looking like a broke down Shaka Khan. And I said, what? What's up, bro? It's your boy, Mike Muse, man. Welcome to another conversation of Mike Muse Show. I have been excited to be in conversation with these next two guests that I have coming up. And I got to give you a little bit of secret, a little secret sauce. This is actually part two of this interview because <laughs> I failed um, by not pushing record. I was so excited to talk to these people because they have been representing my work for the last eight weeks that we've been in COVID-19. Um, and I wasn't honest with them. Um, when we started the conversation. So it was good I'm honest now because Tamar has been so vulnerable um, in her truth. So I think it's important to share that my truth, I didn't let them know how important it was for them for me to be on my show. And that's why I didn't push record. Jesus Christ, I'm about to get emotional. Because it's been so hard to advocate for Black men, um, in particular, during these eight weeks of COVID-19. And so I've really been talking a lot about the mortality rate of Black men is going to hit the highest because COVID-19 has a disproportionate mortality rate on Black people because of all their underlying pre-existing conditions, cardiovascular disease, hypertension, uh, blood pressure, diabetes, you name it. But then Black men even over-index in the people of color who suffer from that. And so the margins for us are extremely high. And when I began to write about that, the pushback I received from that was very visceral and very vile from you guys. Um, it became, what about the Black women and what about the other whites and the Latinos and all the things? And then when I stepped out and really focused on the issue of health care from health, from hair health in terms of Black beauty salons and Black barbershops, the pushback from the others, well, what about the white stylists? What about the white barbers? But them not really understanding how Black men and Black barbers has been the first uh, barbershop and the first entrepreneurial element that was birthed uh, out of slavery. And so to have these two individuals who represent hair, not from this very vanity perspective and very vanity place, but from a very substantive, rooted, authentic place was so special to me. And so I think that is why in the journey and the emotion that I was feeling prior to long, long <laughs> I forgot to push record. And Tamar, you ended the first cut of the take really speaking about your truth when I asked you about the exuberance you felt when they, how, when they yelled cut um, for the show. And you were just jumping for such joy. And I was asking you why. And you talked about representation for Black women, but more so, Tamar, you, you're talking to yourself almost in a third-person narrative and almost <laughs> achieving to be that person that you aspire to be within the realm of that. How important is that for Black women to see and to hear uh, that example, just to know that 
the movie can always change in the ending, as you so beautifully said. Well, um, I said <clears throat> that you can't, well, I, this is what I grew up listening to with my parents. You can't change the picture in the middle of the movie. And I, I took that as like, oh, if, if something is the way that it is, that's just the way that it's going to end up being. No, I had to learn for myself and from my journey um, through my ups and downs and my embarrass embarrassing moments that um, I saw myself on television, not in the best light. And I didn't like that person at all. I didn't like that person on television and I didn't like that person at home because of what I saw on television, if you understand what I'm saying. Yeah. And for me to do this show has been a long, hard road um, because not everybody want you to be seen in a different light. Nope, not everybody wants to show your growth. Some people want to show black women in particular being lost, confused, down, broke, broken, um, and over. Yeah. And for me, it was important that I change the narrative. It was important that not only do I elevate myself in my personal life, I elevate myself from what people see on television. The responsibility I, I took as my own because I am in television. You know, at one time I had four, four number one shows on four different networks, right? And who was I representing? Who was that girl? I can't tell you that, but I can tell you about the girl now and the girl that you see now on this show. And I was so elated to have wrapped a show that I was proud of, a show that I could talk to another a woman. And it wasn't always a black woman. It, sometimes it was a man. Sometimes it was a white girl. Sometimes it was a, uh, an Asian girl. But what, what I was proud of is that I was able to go there with them and understand them and let them know that they have been heard because I was trying to be heard. So I had learned that lesson. So I could pass that on to somebody else. And I could, you know, give somebody an, an opportunity to grow and to feel and not feel bad about feeling and not be ratchet and not cuss them out and not throw a glass at them, but be proud of what I've been through and pass it on to somebody else. And that black girl who was hugging this guy, Johnny Wright, <laughs> was writing about the, the black woman that I was representing, the positive, yeah. amazing black woman who I chose to be. Ooh. Yeah. Tamar, yeah. that is so powerful right there in terms of the black woman that you chose to be and that black woman that you wanted to be yeah. um, and showing the range. And that speaks to journey. Uh, Johnny Wright, so I'm coming to you about journey because for, yeah. for those of you who may not be aware, Johnny Wright uh, was a hairstylist to our forever first lady, Michelle Obama, where I had the chance to meet and connect with him um, a couple of times in that space and environment. But to what she's saying, to what Tamar is saying, Johnny, in terms of that black girl within and wanting to come up, we saw the journey of Michelle Obama throughout the years. We saw her mm -hmm. professional growth, her political growth. We saw her mm -hmm. star power increase. But as a Black woman, that comes with some bumps. That comes with what the media and society deems you to be and speak. And how dare you have a voice and want to have your own platform within the people's house to advocate for things. I'm just curious, what did that mean for you and the intentionality that you had to choose the hairstyles? But I'm actually now, Johnny, curious about when you were around young black girls who run up uh, to Michelle, what did you mm. feel to as well? Because you're just a part of that representation as she is. Yeah, you know, that part for me, I think is the most beautiful part of the journey that I had with Mrs. Obama. You know, seeing those black girls admire her, seeing those black girls, being able to see themselves in her and, and possibly their future ahead and knowing that they can be represented in this matter. That was huge for me. You know, I always say that image isn't everything, but if you did a graph, if you did a graph of like when the first lady started, when they, the America first started seeing the first lady and how her popularity grew with her evolution, you would see that her popularity began to grow more as her look um, continued no. to change and evolve, you know? And I, I, I honor that. I'm so happy that I was a part of that because I do feel like no matter what, people are not willing to really listen to you unless they want to look at you. So that's where my job and image plays a big role 
in society, um, in the celebrity world, in the political world, with my everyday clients, it's a big deal. Mm -hmm. But what about those when you would, even if you, the black girls, you weren't around them and they ran up to her and hugged her, right? But you couldn't help but see in a newspaper and the articles that was written about her, right? In the comment section that were yeah. always positive, knowing you played a role in that, how did that impact you, right? Because you're an art, I look at this as Tamar as an artist, I looked at, I look at hairstylists as an artist too as well. You guys are using a canvas, right? And you guys are yeah. equal parts vulnerable because it's your work that's being displayed. Yeah, thank you for that. And see, for me, that's what what kept me in the game. It was very difficult for me to be in a political world, especially coming from a, a celebrity world, and it's completely different. But I knew that it was my duty to America to make sure that I was a part of portraying a woman of her stature and how she was able to be presented. That was really important to me. I felt like, you know, as a country, as a nation, we were winning because of her image. And we were winning because of the things that were coming out of her mouth. And we were winning, winning because we had her as our first lady. So it was really important for me to stick that out. As many times I wanted to give up, as many times I wanted to say, okay, I think I've had enough. I wanted to stay there to the very end. So, because I knew that I was, it was my duty to be a part of something so special. Yeah. I mean, but now, Tamar, that goes to like finding your voice, right? And having that tireless duty. And finding your voice and maintaining that voice isn't easy. I think for me, identity and voice is connected to hair, right? As you were going through that personal journey that we all saw publicly, as you're going through your personal journey and being vulnerable as you are. And Tamar, thank you for having my back underneath that fiasco. I appreciate that. Uh, how, and how was identity and hair tied to you helping discover or rediscover your voice? Um, when I was a slave to wigs and weaves, I had absolutely no idea who I was. Seriously. I did not know me outside of whatever was attached to my head. Um, <clears throat> I was on a quest to find myself. And during that time, I wanted to fall in love with myself. I wanted to really get to know myself. Um, I remember that week that I got my hair cut off. It was my birthday week and I was going to the salon to get my birthday weed. It was very important to me to look amazing, right? <laughs> <laughs> and everybody know what I'm talking about. Everybody wanted to fly on their birthday, right? <laughs> so I was excited. I ordered my hair. You know, it was the right shade. It was the right length. I was like, yes, okay? And I promise, just like that, it came to me. Uh, you have to shave your head. Wow. For real. And I, I didn't question it. After that, I didn't question it. I went to the salon. I'm like, yo, change your plans. I want my hair shaved. And I promise you, and it was Kim Kimball's hair salon. I, I, they had a meeting in the corner about like, no. And I held up the clippers. I was like, yo, if somebody don't come shave my head, I'm going to do it myself. Wow. It was so important for me. Now, let me just explain something to you. My career was going through obstacles because of my marriage was, was ending. Um, my sisters and I wasn't getting along. I didn't agree with what was being shown on television. I hated what the show had become. I hated the representation that we were showing black women. I felt like our, our responsibility was greater. And I just couldn't handle another strand of hair. I just couldn't take it. I wanted to like me Ooh. and love me when I woke up in the morning. And I wanted that person who woke up in the morning to be the same person at lunchtime. And that person at lunchtime, I needed her to be that person doing dinner. And then who she was going to bed. Like, I did not want to take off my wig another night and turn into a pumpkin at 12 o'clock like Cinderella. No. I needed to love the person that I was living with. And I'd gotten so engorged in all oh, the Braxton family values of Tamar and Vance and um, what am I doing here in television here? What am I doing here singing? This? No, who, who am I? Who is this girl? Mm -hmm. 
I had to morph, I had to morph into somebody that I wanted to be, who I strive to be like. And I didn't know where I was going to find that until that day that I cut my hair. And I wanted to add on something that you said, Johnny, about Michelle her, and her involvement with her hair from when he was senator all the way up to the campaign and then them being in the White House. She became somebody we all wanted to be, the Black American woman, right? Because she allowed her hair to change. It went from here to here to the silk press that we love on the perm box. <laughs> no, for real. And what that showed me was not having the fear of evolution, you know? And sometimes we can get so stifled into that person who we have been striving to be that we don't we don't see the up and up and up you know and sometimes our success can be our failure because we are so stuck in that success for now without seeing the future and the success the real true success which is evolution you have said something so powerful just now, yeah. Mar, that not only speaks to black woman, women, but you spoke to this black man. I thought about all the times that I was a beholden to something. I was enslaved by something. And, and for me, it was dress. I had to have the perfect suit. Every time I showed up, I had to be perfectly tailored. For you, your hair was your birthday. I used to have these really big birthdays here in New York City, and I had a private designer and tailor, shout out to Alexander Nash, before it became popular amongst Black men to have. And I had to make sure we went through at least a month of preparation for my outfit that I was going to have on my birthday. Right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, to the point now, Tamar, that I don't even celebrate my birthdays like I used to anymore. I don't even think about clothes anymore. When I, I go, I buy coastal. So now when I go to LA, I pack a carry-on and all my outfits now come from pretty much Uniqlo because they're basic colors, yeah. they're basic pants. Like if I had to get dressed up in jazz, I'm not coming, right? Because I don't want to be around energy where people yeah. are definitely forced into something. And Tamar, that freed me from that narrative of I have to be something that I'm not for your definition to see me as valid and real, mm. as successful, right? Like that doesn't define you. And now I kind of laugh at men when I see them so jazzed. And you guys are great, fellas. I, I want to be really clear. No shots fired. But I kind of chuckled and was like, one day they'll be free, right? To see mm. them look in the morning, at lunch, and at dinner, and at night. So thank you for that. I want to let you know you're, you're related to, gen, to, to gender. So Johnny, with you, because you're responsible in that moment of transition for people's breakthrough, right? You're responsible mm -hmm. for having that clipper and shaving those stresses off, right? As they become new, how are you wrestling? And or no, not how are you? How do you see women coming? And can you recognize when they're about to have that breakthrough moment when they feel so heavy? Because I do believe hair is spiritual too, with the head, the crown. Absolutely. Right? Like, can you feel yeah. that, that moment? All the time. All the time, you know, the one thing I would say is I'm, I'm pretty connected. Um, and after being in the business for 30 years, it's hard not to really understand and learn your clientele and specifically learning women and their behavior and when it is time for change. Um, for me, it's not something that I necessarily wrestle with. Um, it's something that I um, pioneer in. I want to introduce change and evolution. I am, I've always been a person who loves to evolve, who loves, you know, I always think the best is yet to come. Even when it's like the best ever, it still can get better. So evolution for me is a uh, commonplace. And I like to introduce that to the women that sit in my chair and whoever walk into my energy. And, you know, basically what Tamar said is she was letting go of some energy yeah. that she had been experiencing for so many years. She wanted to get rid of that energy and that energy she was holding in her hair. 
that energy she was holding in her hair strands. And I've always said that I want to change the world one strand at a time. And if, if eliminating those strands is going to help evolve you and to change you, we must do that. I'm, I kudos to you, Tamar, for doing that. Because I remember when you did that and you just felt so free. It felt, you, you felt it. I didn't even, we weren't even in each other's world then. And I just felt your freedom from, from that moment. So any woman that wants to change, the, the, if you think about it, when a woman goes through a breakup or a divorce or they, 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 they lose a job, what is the, one of the first things they do? They change their hair mm -hmm. because they want to tell a new story. They, yeah. want, they have a new narrative. Yeah. That's the reason why they do it. And that's the reason why we do this show because it really, really talks about how passionate people are about their image and how passionate people are about their narrative. And so when you have those traumatic moments when somebody is like, taking out your hair from a chemical cut or a chemical burn or didn't give you the right look or give you the right story that you wanted to tell. It's traumatic and we, we get that. So I'm curious then because now you guys are going somewhere I wasn't anticipating going when I was thinking about the Catch a Beautician. I, I've always in, enjoyed the narrative and the thought of what the Catch a Beautician really is, right? It's about fixing something, change, representing what hair means to black women, representing what hair means for our culture, representing what hair means for our black identity, representing what hair means and showing up and showing out, as we kind of say within social media now. Uh, but listening to Tamar, you talk about your experience, me adding in on my journey, Johnny, you being the conduit of that journey uh, with the clippers that comes to it i'm thinking about how traumatized we are because the premise of the show the catch beautician really ladies and gentlemen is when a client has a hairstyle that went wrong essentially they bring back the stylist who did the damage and then they can do a course correction but now i'm talking to you guys i'm looking at it now from a place of healing right yeah, and absolutely letting go right Absolutely. Talk to me then about it from that perspective and that narrative about when you see that moment or that client, you know, the reveal, you know, when the hair is done and it's healthy again, like talk to us about what you're witnessing, I guess from a spiritual moment, right? In terms of that healing kind of moment. It was a lot of those moments. Mm -hmm. Times that Johnny and I are sobbing because it's so deep for them, you know, and we can relate because it's never just about hair. Right, we're sitting here talking about hair, but it's not just about hair. Yeah. Hair is tied to so many emotions. You know, like if somebody goes, like one of our clients came, let's, let's say Taylor Coco, her weave was so tight, she had a bald spot in her head, Ooh. right? Yeah. And you know, she was she was a lot, and although she was a lot, she <laughs> was, she was yeah. changed her whole demeanor. John, do you remember that? Like she was. Yeah. So, you know, agitated and irritated just to see, see and be around Keisha, who was her stylist, because she egged an emotion, which was, oh my God, I have a hole in my head. How am I going to dance? How am I going to get in front of people and be this fabulous, amazing, big, beautiful model? How, how am I going to do this? I can't do this because I'm not happy with myself. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And at the end of the show, it was so clear. <laughs> That that was yeah. the issue. Mm -hmm. She to the point where she had to put a towel over her head while getting her makeover. She wasn't happy with herself at all. She had to deal with that, and she yeah. stopped dealing with it because she had a hair catastrophe. And I want you all to keep in mind that was not scripted. At I all. had no idea that she was going to put a scar, a towel over her head. We had no idea that was going to happen. This is, these are real emotions. And I think that's what I really love most about this, this, this show. And I want people to really get into is that we really are telling people's stories. We really are getting into people's journeys. And yes, we kiki and kaka all throughout the show and it's fun. And we, we're going to continue to do that, of course. But at the end of the day, this is, this is about people's narrative yeah. and how that they hold that so close and dear to their heart. Yeah. I just want to say, and I'm not going to keep you guys, audience, this conversation is so authentic. When you hear Tamar and Johnny talking the way that they are, it truly is genuine. This isn't just for a radio show conversation that will be on Instagram with the sound bites. This isn't for the YouTube. This isn't to sell the show. Their grace is so real and genuine because let me tell y'all something. 
I, y'all know I'm a perfectionist. I mean, y'all know I hate losing. I am a type. I was homecoming king in high school, college, the first black Mr. Michigan, the first man to raise a million dollars. Like I was appointed to mayors when I was in high school to be part of representative of my city. Like I'm that guy. And I lost and I failed in front of them in an epic kind of way. And they sat and stayed an additional 30 minutes because I freaking <laughs> forgot to push record. Let me tell you about something. When you are on radio and you're dealing with talent and big name talent who have created four shows and performed in front of sort of audience, that was a flex for you, Tay Marple, what you said earlier. And when you've done the first lady, Black Lady United States hair, you don't have to sit, right, for an additional half hour because a Negro messed up. Uh, but y'all helped me down. <laughs> And I just can't thank you enough for that grace you extended. And so I can't even imagine the grace you guys extended in the studio and in the salon um, as you guys were transforming those women's lives. So thank you for well, that. Well, listen, let, let me just say this to you. I, and I think I can speak with Tamar on this too. We've done a ton of press over the past couple of weeks and we have a ton of more press to do. It's safe to say that the conversation that you wanted to have has been one of the best conversations. And I think will drive more people to watch our show because it gives us some real substance. It is not just about catching a musician and put somebody on the spot and having a makeover. It's really what this show is all about. People's narratives and getting deeper into, you know, not just black women, but all women in their hair and men as well too. Yeah. Thank you for that. Thank you, Johnny. Yeah. Thank you, Tay Mark. I appreciate you guys. Thank you, Chanel, for letting them hang on a little bit longer. Uh, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, please make sure you watch To Catch a Musician on Mondays. They are killing it in the ratings, says Johnny. Uh, I can't wait for you guys to tune in. Uh, Tamar and Johnny, you guys have got to come back, man, to the Mike View Show. We can do yes. and some other topics, too, as well. It's so hard for me to see And to everything to me But I guess I got